Okay, so in the last video we talked about uh, how stellar evolution works for relatively smaller stars. Uh, and of course when I say smaller stars, the masses we're talking about are very, very large. Um, but when I say smaller stars, I'm meaning stars up to a mass of about eight solar masses. And basically what happens is um, as the star um, ends its time on the main sequence and it runs out of hydrogen, the core collapses and that basically um, causes temperatures to increase and it causes the star to expand and it sets off more um, levels of fusion. And so you can fuse helium and you can fuse carbon and oxygen and higher elements depending on how much star uh, mass you initially had. And um, the ultimate outcome is basically going to be that the outer shell kind of drifting off into space and forming what's called a planetary nebula and living behind the core of the star, that white dwarf we talked about, where no, no more fusion is happening. Now, by the way, I've, I've had some people ask me, you know, how, how do we know black dwarfs uh, would exist if, if none of them exist yet in the universe? And the explanation is very simple. Of course, a white dwarf is basically just a dead star core. There's no more uh, new energy being produced by fusion. So basically, you just have something really, really hot sitting in space that's really, really cold. And so, you know, even though black dwarfs don't exist yet, it's not, it doesn't take a huge leap of logic to think if you have something really hot sitting in space, which is really cold, eventually it's going to cool down to something that's not hot anymore. So that's the idea of the black dwarf. Okay, but today we're going to talk about stellar evolution for more massive stars. That's stars that start off with a mass of more than eight solar masses. And the way they evolve is different um, than the stellar evolution process for um, stars more like our sun. Our sun is going to end up as a white dwarf someday. And so we're going to talk about um, stellar evolution for stars with a mass between eight and 40 solar masses and then greater than uh, 40 solar masses. Okay, so we've talked about some of these before. Um, of course, if a star has, you know, less than eight solar masses, um, it's going to end up as a, a white dwarf, eject a planetary nebula, etc. This chart just kind of summarizes the stellar evolution of those smaller stars that we talked about before going through the red giant phase, um, ejecting most of their mass via the planetary nebula, and then ending up as a white dwarf. Okay, and there might be different levels to this depending on um, how much mass the star had to begin with and you know whether or not there's enough mass to cause helium to fuse or oxygen to fuse or whatever other higher elements. Now for the more massive stars you get different outcomes. Okay so take a look at this flow chart that kind of shows you the two possible um, or the three uh, different outcomes I guess of stellar evolution. So far we've talked about um, basically this ultimate outcome, the planetary nebula and the white dwarf outcome. And that's for stars uh, that are main sequence stars uh, with a mass between, you know, whatever the lowest possible mass is and up to eight solar masses. Now, for a main sequence star with a mass greater than eight solar masses, rather than becoming a red giant, it's going to become what's called a red supergiant or a super red giant. And basically, um, you can fuse higher elements up to iron inside the core. And the way that happens, basically we've talked about before, uh, is that all that mass is exerting a really heavy inward gravitational pressure and that, that produces higher temperatures. And with enough mass, you get high enough temperatures to cause fusion all the way up to iron. Now you can't go past iron um, because if you think back to um, the binding energy per nucleon graph that we learned about in IB Physics 1, we know that iron is one of the most stable elements that exists and so you can't really fuse anything past iron uh, at least not in the core of a uh, star. Okay, Now stars that form uh, super red giants have two possible outcomes. Okay, They don't end up as you know they don't go the red of the planetary nebula and the white dwarf. They are going to explode fantastically explode in what's called a supernova and then after the supernova they're going to end up either as what's called a neutron star or possibly as a black hole depending on how much mass they have. Okay, so those are the three possible outcomes either you know as a white dwarf or as a neutron star or as a black hole. Those are the three outcomes of any given star. Now um, First of all, let's talk about the fact that there is actually a limit to how big a white dwarf can be. And there's something called electron degeneracy that 
we're not going to talk about it. It's a quantum mechanics thing that we're not going to get into. You don't need to know exactly how that works. But basically, electron degeneracy has to do with how closely can you pack electrons together. Because there's a point where you can't pack electrons together anymore. And they're, you know, if you try to push them too close together, they're going to push back. And so basically, that's going to put a limit on um, how big a white dwarf can be. And so you cannot um, get a stable white dwarf um, with a mass of greater than 1.4 solar masses. Okay, that, that's what this symbol is right here. That capital M is for mass, and this little circle um, with a dot in it is the mass of our sun's core. Now, 1.4 solar masses, you need to make sure you understand that is the mass of the core of the star, not the mass of the star when it was a main sequence star. And so remember when a star dies and it gives off, you know, most of its mass as a planetary nebula, if it's a small, smaller star, what stays behind is just the white dwarf part or just the core part. Okay, so white dwarfs can only exist up to a mass of about 1.4 solar masses. And this is called the Chandrasekhar limit. And this is basically an upper limit on the mass of a white dwarf. Now, if the mass is greater than 1.4 solar masses, now again, I'm talking about the mass of the core, not the mass of the star as a main sequence star, but the mass of just the core itself. If the mass is greater than that, then um, basically the gravitational pressure is so strong it overcomes that electron degeneracy pressure. And that means the star is either going to become a neutron star or a black hole. Okay, so it's a little confusing because you keep seeing masses like, oh, eight solar masses and then 1.4 solar masses. Just keep in mind the 1.4 solar mass thing is the mass of the core. The eight solar mass thing is the mass of the star itself before it ends its life. Okay, so evolute. So basically, a star is going to end up with um, as a white dwarf if it if while on the main sequence it had a mass of eight solar masses or less and then after that the stars um, the white dwarf part of the star cannot have a mass greater than 1.4 solar masses okay so it's a little confusing we keep going back and forth between talking about the mass of the stars and the mass of the cores sorry about that so we've talked about evolution of stars with a mass of less than eight solar masses before and basically, if you have greater than eight solar masses, you get this red supergiant phase that we talked about before, and you start getting more and more and more fusion layers inside the core of the star, um, all the way up to, like I said before, iron. Now, eventually, what's going to happen is, um, you know, the core is going to become iron in the red supergiants, and all the fusion is going to stop, and then when fusion stops because you can't fuse past iron, then the core is going to start to collapse under the weight of gravity because remember normally a star is in that delicate equilibrium between gravitational pressure inward and the radiation pressure outward. And when you get to iron, you can't fuse anything past iron and so fusion is just going to stop inside the core. Okay, so the core is going to collapse under gravitational pressure and when that happens, um, you're going to get a really big explosion. Okay, these are just some pictures to show you the relative size of supergiants. Um, our sun is the small dot over here, and then these are just some, you know, supergiants that we know about. Um, and that's just showing the different layers inside a uh, supergiant. Okay, so when the core collapses, you get a um, super super big explosion because all this mass is traveling inward very very quickly under the weight of immense gravitational pressure and fusion is stopped because again you can't fuse anything past iron in the core of a star and so gravity wins and so gravity pulls all this mass together you get immense temperatures and um, basically what happens is the core collapses and then kind of um, the outer material like bounces off and you get this huge explosion and this is what's called a supernova. And I will show you a, a kind of like a 3D animation of a supernova. It's a very violent explosion. This is not like the planetary nebula thing where you know, it just kind of puffs off into space, um, leaving behind a white dwarf. This is much more quick and violent, something like this. And it creates an immense amount of energy and heat 
and it happens very, very quickly relative to the life of a star. And afterwards, the remnants are so bright that um, if they're close enough, we can even see them from the Earth. And so um, it's been a couple hundred years, but in the past, there's been times when a star close to us went supernova, and we were able to actually see the remnants for weeks afterwards because you know, these things are very, very, very bright and hot and luminous. These are just some pictures of a supernova. Okay, so the inner core, um, you know, goes supernova, giant explosion, an enormous amount of energy is released, the vast majority of its mass. Um, and by the way, if you want to know how do we get elements higher than um, iron on the periodic table if they can't be created by fusion, this is basically how it happens. It, the energy pr uh, released in the supernova is enough to fuse higher elements um, past iron on the periodic table. Okay, so those are where the most heaviest elements in the universe come from. And you can read what it says on these slides. I'm just kind of trying to go through quickly. This is kind of an interesting fact. During this short interval, a supernova can radiate as much energy as the sun would emit over 10 billion years. And enough energy so that they can be visible if you're close enough for weeks or months afterwards. Now, this is basically the super high mass equivalent of a planetary nebula. So the supernova produces a giant explosion, but afterwards you still have the core. Now, after um, a, a planetary nebula uh, goes off, you end up with a white dwarf. After a supernova, you end up either with a neutron star or a black hole. Now, what is a neutron star, you ask? Well, so we talked about the Chandrasekhar limit, that 1.4 solar mass limit of the core, and how if you go past that, then basically gravity is so strong it can even overcome that electron degeneracy. Now, what happens at that point is you have so much gravitational pressure pushing things together, the electrons actually start to fuse with protons and form neutrons. And you get what's called a neutron star, which is exactly what it sounds like. It is a star comprised almost entirely of neutrons. Okay, super, super, super dense. One of the densest things in the universe, actually. Um, you're talking about taking a star, um, you know, way, way, way more massive than our sun and basically compressing it down to something that's, you know, a couple miles in diameter. Okay, so the neutron star is one of the densest things in the universe because at this point you have so much gravitational pressure inward. Like I said, the, the electrons fuse with the protons to become neutrons. Now, there's a limit to how neutrons, uh, how close neutrons can get to each other, and that leads to something called neutron degeneracy, which is basically like electron degeneracy for neutrons. Um, and so as you try to push neutrons closer and closer together, they also resist that. And so um, that puts some type of limit on how big a neutron star can be. Because if you get enough mass, theoretically, then you can even overcome that neutron de degeneracy and get something different. And so we have something called the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, which is three solar masses. And so as long as the mass of the core does not get above three solar masses, then the um, neutron degeneracy stops any further compression. Now, if you have a core greater than three solar masses, then, the, then you overcome the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, and there's so much gravitational pressure, the neutron star itself um, would collapse, and you get what's called a black hole. Okay, now, I know there's a lot of limits here, but basically the two limits you need to know about are the Ch Chandrasekhar limit, which is the upper limit on the white dwarf, the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, which is the upper limit on a uh, neutron star, and if you go past the Oppenheimer-Volkoff limit, which is three solar masses, then you end up with a black hole. Okay, now I cannot do these things ju um, justice because they're very interesting topics, so I'm going to include some extra uh, crash course astronomy videos um, so you get more information about how this works. Um, 
but the last thing we're going to talk about is a black hole. And basically, a black hole is formed when you have so much gravitational pressure that even though you have neutron degeneracy trying to stop the neutron star from collapsing either further, and remember, neutron stars are super, super, super dense to begin with. Again, ma massive stars, you know, hundreds of times, or not hundreds, dozens of times more massive than our sun, compress into the size of, I don't know, 15 or 20 miles across, okay? Amazingly dense. A black hole is formed when you have so much mass and so much gravitational pressure, you can even overcome that neutron degeneracy um, and form something even crazier, okay? So a black hole is basically a collapsed core of a massive star, um, which has so much mass, the gravitational field is so strong that once you get close enough, once you get past what's called the event horizon, um, nothing can ex escape that gravitational field, not even light. And that's why they're called black holes, because, um, again, if you get inside that event horizon, which is basically like a, a kind of boundary or a border around um, that the black hole, once you get inside of there, um, nothing can come out, because gravity is so strong um, that even light does not have enough speed to escape, and because there's nothing faster than light uh, in the universe. Uh, that's basically the same as saying nothing can escape. And I would love to talk more about black holes because they're very, very interesting things, but unfortunately we just don't have enough time. Okay, so we're going to have to end it there. Just to show you, um, this is just kind of like a diagram showing you the, the different routes a star can take as far as its stellar evolution goes. The main sequence stars, um, depending on how much mass, can either end up as a white dwarf, or if they're more massive, they can end up as supergiants and then go supernova and end up as a neutron star or as a black hole. And then this is just kind of showing you the, uh, the flowchart version of that. Okay, so I wish we had more time to talk about some of these things. I will link this fun animation that I found, uh, or not animation, simulation, so you can kind of see, uh, play around with different stars and see how their position on the main sequence changes over time based off of how much mass they have. Okay, I will include that link uh, in this video, and I will also link um, those, or actually I, I think I'll probably include them as separate videos, those um, Crash Course Astronomy videos so that you can get a more in-depth explanation as far as these more massive stars go, because it's a very interesting topic. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about these things. Um, I wish we could have talked about these things in class, um, but I think we've run out of time. Um, and so please, as always, let me know if you have any questions. I really hope you've been enjoying this topic so far. Um, and if you want more information, of course, there's always uh, the internet. You can look up stuff on your own and find answers to your own questions. So please let me know if you have any further questions after watching this video.